All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you everyone for being here, welcome, and thanks for joining us for the George Washington Forum's first event of the academic year. I'm Court Roday, and I serve as the director of the Menard Family George Washington Forum and as associate professor of economics here at Ohio University. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I want to emphasize that we wouldn't be able to put on events like these without the generous help of, of many, many people. Uh, I want to recognize especially the Menard family uh, and many others here at the university. Lori Bauer for her generous support and her help as the uh, College of Arts and Sciences communication specialist. She helps us get the word out. Um, also, Nikki Ohms in events helps us secure and plan the space. Jonna Fisher and Jen Campbell help us with travel. Cameron Dunbar and his help on a daily basis as the program coordinator. And finally, Brandon Logan of Cream Media uh, for his video and website services. So to introduce tonight's guest, Professor Bart Wilson, uh, one of the benefits of my job is meeting new people whose work I greatly admire. Uh, however, I've known Bart for many, many years now. And we met at a graduate student workshop on experimental economics at Chapman University that he was hosting with Vernon Smith and Dave Porter, Steve Resenti, and, and many other uh, well-known scholars in the world of experimental economics. And I was a, a second year PhD student and had just read an article by Bart that had been published in the American Economic Review that blew me away in many aspects. Uh, it's research focus, it's the question it was asking, the, the methodology was cutting edge, its results were fascinating, and it left me with so many questions that I thought, you know, I'm gonna work up the courage to talk to, to Professor Wilson and ask him a few questions. And I just hope to, you know, catch him for five minutes in between conference sessions. And so I was surprised that he invited me to go to lunch and allow me to pick his brain regarding the project and anything else. Uh, unfortunately for him, my questions were neither groundbreaking nor useful. <laughs> and I don't know if I've improved in that regard today. Um, but fortunately for me, it led to opportunity to work with Bart at the Economic Science Institute at Chapman University after completing my PhD. And I've greatly appreciated his mentorship and friendship ever since. Uh, I bring this up because Bart has a, a very long list of accomplishments and accolades, and yet his humility and curiosity are such that he's genuinely interested in others' ideas, even those of unproven graduate students. And he demonstrates this through the way he teaches, his frequent uh, co-authorship with students, and his intention to integrate diverse academic fields in his scholarship. While I was at Chapman, we co-taught a class called Humanomics, which later became a book that he wrote with Vernon Smith. Uh, and we co-taught this class with our friend Jan Osborne from the English department. And the course looked at three questions. What makes a nation rich? What makes a good person good? And what do these questions have to do with one another? <clears throat> Needless to say, I was very uncomfortable being a co-teacher in, in this class. Uh, my background in philosophy, ethics, and was zero at the time. So outside the economics text for the course, we studied Thoreau, Tolstoy, Steinbeck, Wordsworth, and many others. And it forever influenced the scholar I want to be. So Bart went on to create a minor in humanomics and then helped to establish the Smith Institute for Political Economy and Philosophy, which seeks to integrate economics and the humanities in the spirit of Adam Smith, as well as integrate research and in undergraduate education. And tonight, he will speak to us about his current project, Meaningful Economics, which is a fitting piece in his larger project to synthesize a fuller understanding of the human condition. So please help me welcome Professor Bart Wilson. Thank you, Courtney, for that very generous introduction. Um, what Courtney doesn't tell you is how, how easy it is to work with him and how much fun it is to work with him. And so um, thank you for inviting me here to your beautiful green corner of the world here. Um, I've never been in this part of the country, and it's a delight to be here. And I look forward to our hike tomorrow morning. So this is part of my new uh, book project. You're going to get the kind of the introduction to it, and you're going to get the conclusion from it. But if you're going to want to, how the whole argument works together, you're going to have to buy the book in about a year and a half. <laughs> Human beings mean. We just do. Human beings contemplate the importance or significance 
of everything, be it an idea, a person, a thing, an experience. If it can be some kind of thing, we value it, inevitably and instinctively. Human life is imbued with meaning, and we conduct our lives with purpose. Economics, I submit, is no different. It's steeped in meaning. Meaningful economics? The question is whether economic science is as much about purposes and human values as it is about describing and predicting the what is of economic events. Is economics, in fact, full of meaning? And what do meaning and purpose and value have to do with traditional talk of economics? I do not mean what ought to be the value judgments of economists themselves about the what is of economics, as every Principles of Economics textbook dutifully explains. The book, the project, is specifically not about economic policy. It's not about making recommendations about what policy should be. It examines the economic assumptions about human conduct in, as the great English economist Alfred Marshall puts it, the ordinary business of life. It describes such assumptions as they manifest themselves at magnitudes that matter in everyday economic activity. It models flesh and blood human beings, not representations of optimal agents. It is about what makes meaningfulness the very core of economics. You heard that correctly. I will argue that meaningfulness is the very core of economics. Meaningful economics? Yes. That which is economics has the quality of great value, significance, and purpose. Economics is about the goodness of the act, the good directions of our motives, the good life, and not a mere matter of material advantage. The value of goodness one of the greatest creations of humankind is in economics. I'll go even further. Consider the possibility that economics serves the purposes of life. I do not mean understanding economic policy in terms of its good intentions or the good feeling of favoring legislation based upon our policy preferences of what should be an economic goal. Your mind may want to go there, but no, the project is not about economic policy. It's not about third, policy, third party, party evaluations of economic goals, and it's not about evaluating economic consequences. My inquiry concerns understanding the principles of economics by what makes human beings understandable to each other in the ordinary business of life our minds consciously attend to human conduct with a concern to make sense of it by predicating people's actions on what they believe, feel, and want. The project uses human conduct to explain the basic principles of economics, property, exchange, and the division of labor with feelings and ethics. If there is something that almost all economists agree on, it's that economics is about consequences, not moral human conduct. Costs and benefits, otherwise known as incentives, are what matter in economics, more so than motives and goals. Economists deal with matters of fact, not with fuzzy feelings and morals. But why? Why must we separate economics and ethics such that the twain shall never meet? Ethics, in the ordinary kind of circular sense of the word, is a pattern of moral fitness in a person or a system of virtues. What makes a virtuous person virtuous is that we can count on them to fit in our daily lives, whatever may come. Whatever happens, we do not have to give them a second thought. They're going to do their best for us and by us, or at least not intentionally injure us. 
It's the unvirtuous or the vicious person that we need to worry about. They interrupt the peaceable flow of life. We have no idea how and when they may take advantage of us, but if they can, they will. And as Adam Smith pithily says, vice is always capricious, virtue only is regular and orderly. Economics, too, is about regular and orderly human action. The other great English economist, Lionel Robbins, says as much. If we probe just a little below the surface of his 1932 book, The Nature and Significance of Economic Science. It was from his definition of economics that I learned to study how society allocates scarce resources among alternative wants to satisfy all our limited necessities. Throughout human history, there are basically two different ways people can go about securing what they want with scarce means. We can go about it capriciously or in a regular and orderly way. Economists optimistically and naively assume the latter and optimize from there, which is why they then join Robbins in saying that the significance of economics is, quote, fundamentally distinct from ethics. And yet, right on the same page, Robbins says that economics, quote, can make clear to us the implications of the different ends we may choose. It makes it possible for us to will with knowledge of what it is we are willing. It makes it possible for us to select a system of ends which are mutually consistent with each other. By invoking human volition and harmonious alignment of goals jointly pursued in a regular and orderly way, Robbins opens the back door for us to commingle economics and ethics. Now, if you are uneasy or unsatisfied with economic analysis, or especially if you are perfectly satisfied and not in the least disappointed to learn in graduate school that De Bruyne's theory of value isn't about human purposes and value, this project is for you. More so than scarcity, economics today is defined in terms of choice. For the current generation of budding economists, Economics is a study of how people make choices. Some go further. Betsy Stevenson, for example, speaks for many economists when she says on Twitter, economics is a study of how people make choices. Learn how to make better choices in your own life and better predict the choices that other people make. Now, right below the surface, if we pause a moment to go there, is the question of, why we choose what we choose and what better means. As part of learning how to make decisions, we may ask our children how they feel and to think of other ways to solve a problem, but our implied question of them is, is that a good choice? To our wayward undergraduates who spend the week in Coachella, we pointedly say, that was not a good choice. From a young age, we learn that choices can be good or bad. Motives and goals when we make choices in life can be good and bad. They are likewise how we come to expect what other people will do. We understand people's actions in terms of the beliefs, feelings, and wants that prompt them to act. So maybe the twain do meet in the connection between the cause and the consequence of our choices. The problem is, economics doesn't study choices in their origin. Actually, it's worse than that. Economics cannot study choices in their origin. Utility maximization cannot distinguish the causes of our actions from the consequences of our actions because it models representations of optimal agents, not flesh and blood human beings. The central premise of my project is that economics and ethics are indeed two sides of the same coin. And moreover, we can study both sides at the same time. We can study the outcomes of our decisions, their costs and their benefits, and the origins of our decisions, our motives and our goals, in an integrated, humanly way. 
Such is the benefit of the project. The cost is that we must give up utility ma maximization except for the very narrow problem for which it was invented. I want to tread lightly here, well aware that economists think there can be no other way. But economists don't simply take preferences for granted. We need preferences. Maximizing utility is our fix. We say and write things like such and such enters the utility function because we cannot observe an element of human behavior without turning it into a preference. The compulsive habit, I argue, is an impediment to understanding the principles of economics as a study of human beings in the ordinary business of life, which is my motive and my goal. So how do we study both sides of the coin at the same time? How do we simultaneously study the what is of the principles of economics and the meanings, values, and purposes of human conduct in the principles of economics. Well, tonight we, come to, we begin by coming to terms with what is missing from the current study of economics. Economics needs moral sentiments. As the brilliant Thomas Sowell articulates, economists pride themselves, and rightfully so, on studying the consequences of economic decisions in terms of the incentives they create, rather than simply the goals they pursue. This means that consequences matter more than intentions, and not just the immediate consequences, but also the long-run repercussions. The mantra in economics is incentives matter and people respond to incentives. And it's true. Restaurateurs do respond to increases in wages by substituting towards automated ordering systems. But the tendency among economists is to treat that mantra as on par with a basic cause and effect principle in natural science. Like Sol, we may say that it's not a matter of opinion that employers respond to rising wages by substituting for automated demand services for labor. Just like it's not a matter of opinion that if you toss an alkali metal into water, it causes an energetic explosion. But in an important way, the restaurateur's decision to automate in the face of rising labor costs is not akin to a chemical reaction that creates an alkali hydroxide compound. The two goings on, as the philosopher and political theorist Michael Oakeshott calls them, are of distinct categories. The restaurateur's decision itself exhibits intelligent action. The chemical reaction does not. Both the restaurateur's decision and the chemical reaction are intelligible. Chemists use ultra-fast photography and computational models to understand the generation of heat and the transference of electrons when an alkali metal contacts water. And economists use the mantra, incentives matter, to understand why a restaurant owner substitutes physical capital for labor when wages increase. Or we can construct a firm's profit maximization problem and deduce mathematically that the demand for labor must slope downward in the long run. But none of these intelligent goings-ons are themselves intelligent. Such a distinction is not between the hard physical sciences or the supposed soft social sciences. You know, since Paul Samuelson's Foundations of Economic Analysis in 1947, economists have attempted to make the discipline look and work as much like a natural science as possible. Nor is the distinction between the psychological and the physical, between what is happening in the restaurant owner's head and what's in the physical world of ordering systems. I specifically do not want to wall off the human mind from its environment. The categorical distinction is, in, as Oakeshott astutely argues, between understanding something as intelligent human action and understanding something isn't. Neither incentives matter 
nor the sign of a partial derivative of the demand for labor make a restaurant owner's decision intelligible in terms of why the human being does what the human being does. A human being understands the meaning of a fellow human being's actions as chosen by someone who feels and thinks and knows and wants something to happen. Such feeling, thinking, knowing, and wanting by our fellow human beings cannot be reduced to something else. But it can be represented by an understanding of something else that cannot be reduced and thought of as intelligent human action. The categorical distinction is that understanding intelligent human action can be thought of something in terms of what every human being does. So if we are to understand intelligent human action in economics, it cannot come from something, say a model, that is not about intelligent action itself. Now, such an observation is not a surprise to economists. They generally share, say, Michael Blaney's view that theoretical models are extremely pared down, simplified representations of reality, and they are likely to remain so in the interest of analytical tractability. This means that they can give us insights into the real world, but they cannot tell us how the real world works. Partial derivatives and incentives matter, make economic decisions intelligible to economists themselves, but they do not explain the economic principle in terms of intelligent human action. They are devoid of the stuff that human purposes and relationships are made. So what does surprise economists is an economist who wants to understand economics with fuzzy, unmeasurable feeling, or what David Hume and Adam Smith call moral sentiments. So we need a framework that puts human feeling on equal footing with knowing, thinking, and wanting, which will make economics all at once ethical, psychological, sociological, and anthropological. We need meaning-making feelings as against that screw machinery of non-cooperative game theory to understand the economics of human intercourse. Now, economists make no bounds about it. They are not in the business of understanding economic principles with moral human conduct. Principles of economics textbooks introduce students to positive economic analysis as that which describes what is going to happen, describes the way the world is, strives to describe what exists and how it works, tries to answer questions about the way the world works which have definite right and wrong answers, develops models of the world and evaluates those models by testing them with data, uses a scientific method to develop economic models which includes testing how well the models work, measures the costs and benefits of different courses of actions, is about describing, explaining, and predicting economic events, is about the consequences of specific policies or institutional arrangements, or describes the economy and constructs models that predict either how the economy will change or the effects of different policies. You get the point. Economics is about intelligible economic consequences, not intelligent human conduct. Meaningful economics is about understanding human action in its origin rather than exclusively in its outcome. So as a complement to the study of economic consequences, meaningful economics explains the roots of conduct and not merely its economic effects by going to the human capacity for feeling and thinking that prompts human beings to act. So in 1933, the philosopher Samuel Alexander published a book attempting to explain the nature of value, beginning with the typical cases of three supreme values, beauty, truth, and moral goodness. With the substitution of economics for the words morals and morality, his description of the problem for moral goodness could serve here. In economics, we are concerned with the passions of men, with their desires for material, or it may be immaterial, objects, 
And the problem which economics has to solve is fitting the satisfaction of these passions, both as within the individual himself and as between the individual and individual. Now, our desires and our wills are directed to some object external to us in the sense that it's not ours yet. And in general, as with food, clothing, sex, office, riches, and the like, the objects are physical material foreign to us, which we make our own. And economics may, from one point of view, be treated as an adjustment in practice to our surroundings. Yet these surroundings, when they are ex our external nature, are but secondary to the desires, or rather the wills, which are bent on attaining them. Alexander is saying that there's something fundamental in of a problem in need of a solution. When people with strong feelings go about their daily lives pursuing their desires, how does everyone do this at the same time? Particularly when we have different ends. How do we adjust our actions to other people as we all seek to acquire material and immaterial objects? Morality, Alexander says, and economics, I say, is about adjusting our actions to fit with everyone else's actions in the ordinary business of life. We may be interested in tending the physical stuff for ourselves, but what concerns us about other people and ourselves is how we go about satisfying our desires. Does the direction of our motives fit with everyone else's in the pursuit of theirs? Or does it come into conflict with others? At first plus, it's remarkable, is it not, that of all things, a description of the problem of morality in an essay on the value of goodness would simultaneously work as well as it does for economics. Sure, the diction of passions and wills rings quaint to the modern ear and completely foreign to an economist, but Fitting satisfactions between individuals in the pursuit of goods and services pretty much sums up Lionel Robinson's famous definition of the economic problem as, quote, the science which studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means which have alternative uses. People want stuff, and many people regularly want the same stuff that other people want, but for their own purposes. In the face of such scarcity, people must find a way to adjust to each other. That is, avoid collisions of conflict. Economics and morality are, then in an important way, two sides of the same coin that is human action. Both boil down to living together. The difference is that economics focuses on the outcomes of such adjustments, the costs and the benefits, and morality on the origins of those adjustments, the good directions of our motives and wills. So in that light, Soul is saying that as much as we might sentimentally wish to, we cannot ignore the actual outcomes of such adjustments. Roger that, Let's take care to do that. I'm saying that we also cannot ignore the origins of such adjustments, as much as we might economistically wish to do, particularly if we want to explain human conduct in the adjustments of life with economic consequences. So economics has an image problem. Some of it is undeserved, but most of it, unfortunately, is deserved and self-inflicted. So a popular misconception of economics is about how to make money or predict the stock market with a handy formula. So when asked about where the stock market is going, the typical economist jokes that if they could make buddy money by predicting the random walk of the stock market, they would be doing that. But alas, no, that's not how that works. But think about what that joke means. It's actually serious. We think that that's what economics is about, maximizing our material interests subject to the constraints that we face in doing it. If there is something that almost everyone agrees on about the modern age, is that commerce is built on self-interest. That's if you're being generous, 
or selfishness if, if you're not. Now, the credit or blame for such an observation is almost universally attributed to Adam Smith. In one of the most famous passages in economics from all time, an inquiry from a selection from an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. He says, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. The modern world broadly summarizes Adam Smith's statement as Gregory Mankiw does in his introductory textbook. Smith is saying that participants in the economy are motivated by self-interest. No, he's not. In 1953, the historian of economic thought, Robert Heilbronner, published his immensely popular book, The Worldly Philosophers, in which he silently amended this quotation inside the quotation marks, a no-no if you're a student, to say, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, Smith says, but from their regard to their self-interest. If you miss the difference, you're not alone. Halbroner changes the phrase own interest to self-interest. Now, even those who more fully read Adam Smith and correctly quote the sentence can't interpret the sentence without discussing it as, quote, their own self-interest. Now, prior to 1953, only one book in Google Books misquotes this passage. After 1953, pages and pages of books come up with the misquotation found inside. And Heilbronner himself repeats the error in 1975 in the fifth edition of his textbook. Now, the change is not inconsequential to his discussion. Indeed, it's central. The paragraph following the misquotation is dedicated to how self-interest is only half the picture. Competition, Heilbronner argues, regulates the pushing of profit-hungry individuals from holding society up to exorbitant ransom. For a community activated only by self-interest would be a community of ruthless profiteers. He further tells the story of how competition transmutes the selfish motives of men in a world in which each agent is forced to scurry after his self-interest in a vast social free-for-all. As Heilbronner reads Adam Smith, the first half of the picture paints the economic problem as dripping with corrupt acts and shady motives as we live a life of scurrying rats. But be not be dismayed, the second half of the picture yields the most unexpected results, social harmony. So Adam Smith's famous or infamous invisible hand of competition directs such bad ex acts and immoral motives to our material advantage. Or, well, at least it did in Smith's time, how Broner qualifies. By the middle of the 20th century, he's uncertain as to whether competition begets material benefits and social harmony. Nonsense, I say. But it's the general story that economic textbooks and economists continue to tell. Celebrating the bicentennial publication of The Wealth of Nations in 1976, the University of Chicago economist and Nobel laureate George Stigler wrote that Adam Smith's magnum opus is a stupendous palace erected upon the granite of self-interest. Self-interest is so much the granite of Adam Smith's argument that he uses the word exactly one time on page 789 in the second volume to describe, quote, the industry and zeal of the inferior clergy in Rome. Some granite for the wealth of nations. And the evidence is not there to support such a reading. In Smith's most famous passage, specifically, nor if you read the wealth of nations more generally. Note that Smith was clearly familiar with the word self-interest. He used it as Heilbronner does, having a powerful motive with a strongly pejorative connotation. And yet Smith chose the neutral phrase, 
own interest over self-interest there and in 35 other places throughout both volumes of the book. Why? Because from all accounts, Smith cared about diction, chose his words carefully, and either consciously or unconsciously avoided using the pejoratively charged term. Now, our regular reaction to hearing that Smith really doesn't say that people in commerce are motivated by self-interest is to say that, no, the market guides such self-interest towards general economic betterment. And they say, that's a distinction without a difference. What's the difference between own interest and self-interest? So to Adam Smith, that difference means that the wealth of nations is not built on a disregard for others as we pursue our own advantage or interest, which is what self-interest means then and now. So definition number two in the OED, now the quote, usual sense, goes back to 1649. It is the preoccupation with or pursuit of one's own advantage or welfare, especially to the exclusion or consideration of others. So before anyone does anything, Smith importantly conditions commercial pursuits this way. Every man, as long as he does not violate the laws of justice, is left perfectly free to pursue his own interest, his own way, and to bring his industry and capital into competition with those of any other man or order of men. To us, that difference means that, as Deirdre McCloskey eloquently argues in her Bourgeois Virtues, modern-day commerce is not an ethical catastrophe nor does it require offsetting material gains to rescue it as a, quote, practical triumph. There is no original sin, nor is any penance required in the basic principles of wealth creation. But purposes and human values are required. Now, the second sophomore level reaction is to regroup and say that everything everyone does is self-interested by definition. My claim is not that selves do not pursue their advantages or act in their own interest. My claim, following Adam Smith, is that, is that selves do not necessarily pursue their advantages, economic or not, to the exclusion or consideration of others. Yes, as he says in the Theory of Moral Sentiments, every man is no doubt by nature first and principally recommended to his own care, as he is fitter to take care of himself than of any other person, it is fit and right that it should be so. But the rest of the very long paragraph goes on to show that having an interest in yourself is not the same thing as acting in your self-interest. In the very first sentence, Smith famously sets the tone for his entire book saying, how selfish soever man may be supposed there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their nece happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. There is no exception for economics. The invisible good directions of our motives and the invisible goodness of an act are part and parcel of the very foundation of economics. But what is the foundation of modern economics? What is the question of questions in economics? Since the late 1960s and 1970s, and invariably since the 1980s, economists have posed it to their students as a problem of how. Economics is the study of how society manages its scarce resources or how to arrange our scarce resources to satisfy as many of our wants as possible or how agents choose to allocate scarce resources and how those choices affect society. Scarcity is universal. It confronts all living things. Even parrots face scarcity. Scarcity is, 
the great economic problem. And economic science is the study of how to solve it. Now the question that immediately follows the fundamental problem of how is likewise a matter of how. How do people choose? Economists meet that question not with an answer, but with an assumption. Now let's call it the assumption of rationality, self-interest, and maximization. But if you're worried about assuming rationality, self-interest, and maximization, don't be. When economists say better off, best feasible, the best, they mean it objectively, factually so. Now, if that's what concerns you, there's no cause for alarm. Economists use the scientific method of the natural sciences to determine the facts. There's a toolkit and a way of thinking that specifies how to conduct your economic analysis. Now, if that sounds somewhat sterile, economists also offers a practical guide in how to live. From your first day of class, you learn that economics is about how, 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 and how. How did the study of economics get here? By not asking why. Lionel Robbins shifted the focus of economics from Adam Smith's study of wealth to examining how individuals make choices under conditions of scarcity. Not only is scarcity universal and unavoidable in society, but to Robbins and to all economists almost a century later, it's self-evidently so. As a student, you must subscribe to its primacy on the exam. And yet, a regular subset of the students get the multiple choice question wrong. What are such students trying to tell us? Perhaps they're saying something more than they didn't read the textbook. Perhaps they're posing a question for us as economists. Adam Smith posts, posits excuse me, a different axiom. The certain propensity in human nature to truck, barter, and exchange one thing for another. What's at stake from adopting Robbins' axiom as opposed to Smith's in economic science? For Robbins, the exchange of things is subsidiary to the main fact of scarcity, quote. The exchange relationship between two people is a technical incident. Quote, it derives from its connection with scarcity. So in the grand tradition initiated by David Ricardo, Robbins argues via the thought experiment of Robinson Crusoe. So by narrowing the going on to a person completely isolated from society, he identifies four conditions that Crusoe faces. One, he wants both things and leisure. Two, he does not have enough of either things and leisure. He can spend his time getting more things or enjoying leisure. And four, his desires for these elements of things and leisure diverge. From these conditions, it follows for Robbins that, therefore, he has to choose. He has to economize. The disposition of his time and his resources has a relationship to his system of wants. It has an economic aspect. Such a conception of economics does not, Robbins point out, limit the inquiry to certain kinds of behavior, as Adam Smith's axiom would appear to do. In fact, if scarcity is the primary axiom, there are no limitations on the subject matter of economic science. Insofar as it presents the four exact conditions, any kind of human behavior falls within the scope of economic generalization, including and especially the exchange of things. So Robin's central move is to argue that the exchange of things can only be explained by going behind his words the relationships between the traders, and invoking the operation of those laws of choice which are best seen when contemplating the behavior of the isolated individual. 
the certain propensity in human nature to exchange things, Robbins contends, is subordinate to scarcity. But must it be? Now, the case that Robbins makes seems compelling, overwhelmingly. Here we are, sentient creatures with bundles of desires and aspirations, with masses of instinctive tendencies all urging us in different ways to action. But the time in which these tendencies can be expressed is limited. The external world does not offer full opportunities for their complete achievement. Life is short. Nature is stingy. Our fellows have other objectives. Yet we can use our lives for doing different things, our materials and the services of others for achieving different objectives. Anyone who has read Jane Goodall's In the Shadow of Man or watched Netflix's Chip Empire recognize that human beings are not the only creature that fits Robin's description of a sentient creature. While great apes, elephants, and dolphins have shown signs of planning for the future or displaying long-term goals, only human beings conceive of time as limited, think of the world as containing obstacles for achieving our ends, contemplate the length and quality of our lives, and consider nature itself to be ungenerous to our kind. In other words, there's something else going on behind the rudiments of scarcity, something deeper than the here and now. There is no economic aspect, I submit, for a sentient creature that does not think about itself, its world, and the place it finds itself in its world. More to the point, there is no economic aspect for a creature who cannot think about the meaning of their situation. Only human beings think about what could be the case, but isn't. Chimpanzees, elephants, and dolphins, let alone parrots, do not in their own mind's eye face scarcity. They perceive and sense what they perceive and sense online and in the moment. The fruit a chimpanzee sees and smells is the fruit it sees and smells. There is no abstract notion of fruit, seeing, smelling, of thinking, dang, don't I live the good life? To perceive scarcity, a sentient being must be able to think offline, beyond the here and now. It must be able to think about less time to do the same work, fewer obstacles, longer and better lives, and more comfortable living conditions. Only human beings cognize the counterfactual in choosing to do this but not that to achieve their ends. Choice is not, as Robin would have us accept, the logical deduction of Crusoe's isolated condition nor is it an objective fact of the natural world that choices must be made. I'm waiting for the lightning to strike me. Crusoe arrives on the island as a fully symbolic being who acts, who ponders what could be the case but currently isn't. His solitary condition is incidental to his being human. The human mind sits behind scarcity. The human mind is the founding primitive of the study of economics. Since I'm at risk of losing my economics ID card and a majority of my dissertation committee revoking my PhD, let me say that I'm not suggesting that economists give up asking how to solve the great problem of scarcity. Many of us became economists because we want people to live well. What am I proposing is that we deeply and meaningfully ask, why do human beings do what they do? If we listen, really listen, that's what our doubting students are asking us. The origins of our actions, ideas, do indeed matter. They are, they are what make us human. And as I'm gonna argue in the book, they make the principles of economics 
property exchange and the division of labor possible. In our theorizing, economic science can directly engage human beings, ourselves, as we really are, not as we ideally assume. We can do this by making human beings the subject of our questions, by making our questions a matter of why, not merely how, and by making the predicate the system of relationships that stems from a certain propensity to truck, barter, and exchange one thing for another. We can be 21st century students of Adam Smith who study economic activity in both its origins and its consequences. Thank you. Questions? Where, so where, where did, in our intellectual journey from Smith till now, where do we go awry? Um, uh, that's, a good, that's a good question. I mean, I do think a little bit of it, I, mean, I make a more of a case in, in, in the book. I think Heil Broner's book was hugely important, um, that somehow I planted out there because I, I literally referee papers where people are quoting, using the quote, coming out of Heilbronner. And I'm like, so you clearly did not go read the Wealth of Nations yourself to get that quotation. <laughs> you just went to Google. <laughs> uh, and, and so, um, so this is, so this is a, I, some part, probably a, a, 20th cent, a mid 20th century and beyond problem. Um, like I'm pretty confident that, you know, Alfred Marshall, who revered Adam Smith in his 1890 book, would not have misinterpreted him in, in, in that particular way. Um, so if I want to, I, I want to kind of pinpoint kind of the Heil Broner in the mid 1950s, which is about the same time, you know, Friedman is going to be taking, kind of making his claims. But, you know, Friedman is also very much misconstrued, you know, he's talking about selfishness, but he, he always qualifies things within an ethical and moral and legal con, uh, framework. Um, usually in the quotations that are, he also are put up there and they just cut off the, the rest of it. So, um, we, but, so we've kind of separated it, but I, I think something in the 20th century economists wanted to give up and get rid of all that messy ethical stuff that's just, that's too all wordy uh, and touchy and feely and we don't want to go there and let's just cut it all off. And, and, and it makes that easier to talk about only this problem. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't study those problems, but we don't open up the, wet, the breadth of the questions that we want to ask and ask deeper ones about why. Um, and the book project is about examples, about how to do that, how we can ask more about why is it that human beings trade one thing for another. So there are going to be four different way, answers to that question, I'm going to argue. I'm going to argue why do we have the division of labor? There are going to be four different ways we can answer that why question. Why do we have property? Again, I'm going to argue there are four different answers to that question. And that is going to help fill it in to be a more complete picture than just a measuring how. And, and so um, when that happened, I, I, I think probably Samuelson would be the guy I'm going to I poke at as kind of starting point for that. Um, and, and language kind of creeps in that I, um, he will describe this notion of utility maximization as a hypothesis. Now, I don't know what books we read now, but utility maximization is never enlisted as a hypothesis, because then maybe it might be up for, for being rejected. <laughs> no, 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 that's just what we do. There's only one way to do it. Um, this, is how it this is how economics is done. So it's not really in a hypothesis. Um, it's an assumption that we won't give up, uh, or we won't, we won't question. Then the other part of, of, of that is that, that when we stick to this one way of thinking about it, we want to impose that that's how other people are. We want to take what they're doing, and we assume that it's optimal, and therefore, what everyone does is optimal. And then we're surprised when they're not. <laughs> but we made that assumption, and then we modified to say, oh, well, if they're not, then that was also optimal. Let me show you how. 
and we're not actually asking why they're doing what they're doing in, in, the, in the first place. And so um, what's missing is a model of explanation. I would argue these mathematical models are not explaining anything. We elide the difference between explaining and describing. And experimentalists are king of this. If you ask them about what they're doing, they're just describing their behavior as subject with the utility maximization problem. But then when they go and run a new experiment, they say, no, no, I'm explaining it by what their people are doing. No, I thought we were describing it. No, now we're, now we're just explaining what they're doing. And that word, language of explanation is also right there in Samuelson, that that mathematical model is an explanation. I'm arguing that mathematical model works as an explanation in the natural sciences because it's not about human beings. <laughs> it's not about, when you talk about human beings, that model of explanation has to be human. That's how we understand each other. And that, that, that kind of is, that gap has been minimized and lost. I think we get, need to get it back. What does like specifically looking at economics outside of, of mathematics look like to you? Like how, how exactly does this work in practice, this process of humanization? Because I find, um, you know, I, I read Humanomics, which is a great book that I find really, really interesting. But I do feel like a lot of the things in it, um, I mean, still work off of you know a typical economic framework, even though it does obviously point out a lot of the same things that you're talking about the shortcomings. So the advice Vernon Smith gave me as a new assistant professor was read broadly, work narrowly. I think the first thing we can do is start reading more than just ourselves as economists. Uh, and so you start, you read, I mean, as, as, as Courtney mentioned in the, in, in the in introduction, if you read a novel while at the same time you're reading about an economics text, it makes you think about the economics in a different way. It also makes you think about the novel in a, in a different way. And, you, and everything seems to be thrown up in the air of how it's going to be reorganized. And so my advice would be just to start reading more broadly. Uh, reading, reading literature to get in the, I mean, li novels make sense because we understand about what people feel, think, and believe. That's, otherwise, there's no way you can make that medium work. <laughs> And so honing that skill is going to be useful to try to understand, now why, is it, why do we have this economic problem? How are, we under, how are we trying to understand people in that particular situation? We might get some tools from, from, from the humanities in order to do that. And we might actually show them that we're not all about self-interest. We're actually interested in people.